Good evening, everybody, and welcome to um, McGill McDonald Campus Food for Thought Public Lecture Series for 2021. Our theme this year is celebrating McGill's bicentennial and the promise of a better tomorrow. My name is Grant Clark. I'm an associate professor in bioresource engineering and one of the organizers of the Food for Thought series, together with Anna Duff and Ingrid Shiraz, who are here with us this evening. I'm also a descendant of Northern European settlers, and I live and work on unceded Indigenous territory. The Ganyangahaga Nation are the custodians of Chiochiagi, the territory on which McGill University stands, and of the surrounding lands and rivers. To the south of Montreal is the community of Karawage, and to the west is the community of Kanasatagi. I thank these people for having watched over these lands and waters for so long, and for continuing to look after them today. I have a few housekeeping points to mention. First of all, the lecture this evening is being recorded. Please keep your audio muted during the lecture, and we will monitor the chat window and relay any questions to the speaker if you wish to ask them that way. Um, at the end of the lecture, during the question and answer period, if you wish to have your question, uh, answer, ask your question verbally, you can raise your virtual hand icon or wave at me, turn on your camera and wave, or leave it open in the chat, and then we'll invite you to unmute yourself and you can ask a question. So with that, I'd like to introduce our speaker for this evening. Uh, Jennifer Ronholm has her BSc from Waterloo and her doctorate from the University of Ottawa. Um, she is a trained microbiologist and immunologist. Uh, she's completed postdoctoral training at McGill and at Health Canada and was hired as an assistant professor in our faculty in 2017. Her interests are primarily in understanding the role of the microbiome in determining susceptibility of individuals to infections, individuals which may include both humans and agricultural animals. In 2020, she was named the World Economic Forum Young Scientist, and she has won the McDonald Campus Award for Teaching Excellence. And she's going to speak to us this evening about the following topic. If we ban antibiotics use in agriculture, can we still feed ourselves? So Dr. Rono, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, so yeah, my topic tonight will be about antibiotics and agriculture. It's an intense question, but I'll try and answer it or at least partially answer it by the end of the talk. So I'm gonna start off with antibiotics. Um, Antibiotics are a class of molecule that are used to treat bacterial infections in humans and animals. There are two different types of antibiotics. There's bacteriostatic and bactericidal agents. Bacteriostatic agents don't actually kill the bacteria, they just stop them from growing and give your immune system kind of a chance to catch up to clear the infection. Whereas with bactericidal agents, um, they kill the bacteria right out and halt your infection. They were discovered in the 1920s, and we've been discovering new classes of antibiotics ever since, with the like golden age of antibiotic discovery really being in the 60s, 70s. And there hasn't been a lot of antibiotic discovery since the 80s. So this is kind of my first point. We're using more than we're discovering recently, which is part of the problem with the antibiotic resistance that we're discovering, that we're dealing with, is that we're not coming up with the classes of molecules to outpace the bacteria anymore. But if we go back all the way to the beginning in 1928, um, the beta-lactam antibiotics, so this is things you might know like penicillin, were discovered by Alexander Fleming. And very soon after, Alexander Fleming realized that there was gonna be problems with resistance. And I really like this quote because it's very insightful um, as to what was going to happen over the next hundred years. So his quote was, the thoughtless person playing with penicillin treatment is morally responsible for the death of the man who succumbs to the infection with the penicillin resistant organism. And a hundred years later, this is kind of still where we are. We're using them, but we don't have a solution to what's going to happen for resistance. 
So I'll be talking about antibiotic resistance a lot. Um, so I'm going to start with how, what antibiotic resistance is. So when antibiotics kill a bacterial cell, they're really doing it by inhibiting one of the important molecules that DNA or that bacteria need to survive. So antibiotics can attack the DNA, which is the um, informational system of the bacterial cell and tells it how to survive. It can attack the ribosomes, which take the DNA, translate it into proteins and enzymes and all the important macromolecules that the bacterial cell needs to survive, or it can attack the cell wall. If it breaks down the cell wall, things will start to leak out of the bacterial cell and the bacterial cell will ultimately die. So if we use antibiotics, the bacterial cell will kind of learn in a sense how the antibiotic works and start developing ways to protect themselves against it. So a good example of this is actually penicillin. So the way a bacterial cell grows its cell wall is to cross-link these layers of peptidoglycan. And for each layer that it stacks on, it adds molecular bridges to hold them together. This makes very strong cell walls and really makes the bacteria resistant to everything going on around it. It does this by building these protein bridges. The molecule that helps in building these protein bridges is called penicillin binding protein. Um, if you add penicillin in, what happens is the penicillin sits in the important site that cross-links the proteins and stops this cross-linkage from happening. When this cross-linkage stops happening, the bacterial cell walls become a lot weaker and start breaking down and that cell can die. It doesn't have to be penicillin sitting in this active site. It can be any of the classes of beta-lactam antibiotics. So they're all things you may have heard of, penicillin, cephalosporin, uh, carbapenemase, but they all work in basically the same way. They work because they have this special thing called a beta-lactam ring. This is what fits in the spot that's important for cell wall development. If you get rid of this beta-lactam ring, these molecules can no longer function as antibiotics. So after bacteria see penicillin a number of times, they were able to develop these enzymes that cut this ring and inactivate the penicillin molecule, making them resistant to penicillin. Another thing they learned how to do was mutate the site that's important for, pep for protein cross-linkage. So they have an antibiotic sensitive enzyme here that works, um, the penicillin inhibits cell wall binding, but they can also modify that particular enzyme so that it still works to grow the cell wall, but penicillin can no longer get in there and therefore penicillin is not effective. So this was a lot of molecular talk, um, but basically the message here is the more antibiotics we use, the more the bacteria get a chance to see what's going on and to develop resistance against them. So one way to think of it is there's, there's almost a budget of antibiotic use. For every new antibiotic we come up with, there's only so many times we can use it before all the bugs learn how to inactivate it. So the questions are, for humanity, how do we want to spend our budget of antibiotic use? And are there ways that we can increase this budget by using what we already have? Because we're not really discovering new ones. So when I used to give a talk that was similar to this one, I'd always say that the antibiotic resistance crisis, crisis is coming. But at this point, I think it's safe to say it's already here. So currently there's about 700,000 people who die annually of a bacterial infection that we're no longer able to treat with antibiotics. So it's resistant to everything we have. Based on how fast this number is growing, and it does increase reliably every year, the estimate is that by 2050, about 10 million people a year will die annually of infections that we have nothing to treat. Um, this is a pretty bleak scenario. Um, it's hard to comprehend how many people that is, but I think like the last year of COVID-19, a little over a million people died in that first year. 
it kind of puts this into perspective. Like that first year of COVID-19 wasn't fun, but this is probably gonna be less fun than that. Um, when you have that many people sick and dying, it's estimated that this is gonna cost the global economy about a hundred trillion dollars, which again, it, it's hard to get your head around how much that is, but it's a lot. Um, there's not a simple solution to this. And I don't wanna downplay COVID because it's been bad, but when it's antibiotic resistance, there's so many different types of infections. There's bacterial parasitic, there's a whole bunch of different types of bacterial infections. So there's no single vaccine that's gonna fix it. There's no single new drug that's gonna fix it. So it's a really, really intense and difficult pro problem. So I'm saying that you're gonna have 10 million people dying and these people are gonna be spread out across the world and it's gonna be um, based on all current projections in a very unequal way. Um, North America probably isn't going to get as hit as hard, but Africa and Asia are going to hit, get hit very hard having most of the deaths occur there, um, which is going to increase you know, already present inequities in economics and healthcare systems. So this is really a multi-level threat to humanity. Um, obviously it's going to affect global health because we'll now have infections we can't treat. But when that happens, there's gonna be more pressure to remove antibiotics from agriculture, which is gonna to lead to food security issues because it's going to cut down in the efficiency of food production in several different areas of the food production systems. It's also going to have effects on development and economics. This used to be harder to imagine how disease could affect economies, but I think it's getting easier. And when you have this type of intense illness going on, development does slow and even regresses from where it is. Um, antibiotic resistance can also affect anyone of any age in any country. So it's not like if you have a good immune system, you'll, you know, definitely resistant to this. You're not. Anyone can have the bad luck of cutting themselves and getting um, an infection that we can't treat with antibiotics. It's not something that's completely linked to the use of antibiotics in human and animals. Resistance does occur naturally. We find antibiotic resistant organisms in the high Arctic where people have never been and there's never been a trace of antibiotics. Um, but the, the use uh, in human and animals and the um, artificial synthesis of these molecules obviously does accelerate the process. And then something else to kind of think about is that the unavailability of effective antibiotics will basically change modern medicine. Um, it'll make childbirth riskier. We won't have the same post-operative care that we have now. Surgeries will be more risky. And anything that suppresses your immune system, like chemotherapy, will be significantly more risky because you won't have any of the natural um, resistance to antibiotics or to bacterial infection. So now I'm going to move into talking about how we use them in agriculture now. So there's three primary agricultural uses. Um, one is for growth promotion, which is to make animals grow faster. One is for prophylaxis, which is to prevent animals from getting a bacterial infection. And the other is for therapeutic. So your animal is already sick, so you have to treat it to make it better. Sometimes the line between growth promotion and prophylaxis is a little blurry, and I'll explain that later. But these are the three primary reasons that you use antibiotics. Um, so I'm going to talk about the benefits of using antibiotics in agriculture. And I find that whenever I talk about the benefits of using antibiotics in agriculture, people step away thinking I'm pro using antibiotics in agriculture. And I don't think that's true. And I don't think that there is anyone that's pro antibiotics in agriculture. Um, I think it's a little more nuanced than that. Agriculture has to evolved and dependence on antibiotics over the last hundred years of growth and development. And it's at a place now where withdrawal is difficult, change is hard, and we don't want to destroy our food production systems while we deal with this problem. It's obviously a big catastrophic problem, um, but we also need food. So when I write about this or talk about it, um, people always propose solutions, like if we all became vegan, and yeah, that might work, but again, like how would you make that happen? 
Um, and then some people say if farms just had better security, biosecurity, you wouldn't need to use antibiotics um, for production or for health reasons. But again, that, that's a how, um, it's a definitely a thing we have to address, but it's not something that can be addressed overnight. And then another suggestion I sometimes get is like, they did it a hundred years ago without antibiotics, why can't we do that now? And there's a number of reasons, but the biggest one is that there were a lot less people to feed a hundred years ago and we need the productivity. Um, and there were also some uh, animal welfare issues a hundred years ago that we don't have now. Um, so just to talk about this history and how we got here, uh, in the 1910s in North America, it was the first time that urbanites outnumbered farmers. So there were more people in cities wanting to buy food than there were producing food. Because of this, there were routinely outstripped meat demands um, where you wanted to buy meat, but you couldn't. So the USDA funded research starting in 1917 um, about increasing meat production. And then a couple years later in 1928, when they discovered penicillin, um, they started to get the idea that this was probably how you could increase meat production. And at the time when they discovered penicillin, no one identified as Staphylococcus aureus, which was resistant to it. Staphylococcus aureus, most of them now are resistant to penicillin. And this is probably one that most people recognize. It's a major cause of animal infections, but it also causes skin infections like MRSA in humans. By 1938, sulfonamides, the next class of antibiotics to be discovered, had been discovered and they were marketed for use in agriculture. And then in the 1940s, it, in, the 19, in 1938, it was actually marketed to prevent infection or to treat infection. But in the 1940s, they discovered that if you fed it at a low enough concentration, it actually improved weight gain. Um, then in the midst of World War II, they figured out that you could use antibiotics to successfully treat um, mastitis in dairy cows. And basically, use expanded from there. Um, they had growth promoting effects in most animals. And then because of this reliance on antibiotics, they basically found that you could have more intensive agriculture purposes. So before the 1950s, there were low density grazings, um, which I always say that's kind of what they show you on Heartland, um, where you have the, the beef cows out um, grazing. But in the 1950s, they switched more to a feedlot system. And this is really intensive agriculture where a lot of animals are put very closely together. Um, so this is a picture of a feedlot in California where 250,000 cows pass through annually which is high density. Um, so to keep infection away in these high density environments, uh, they used a bunch of things over the years like chlorotetracycline, oxytetracycline, and bacitracin. Bacitracin and ionophores are still commonly used in this idea. Um, so between this 51 to 70 period where we started contracting and putting more animals in smaller spaces, the antibiotic usage increased about 30 fold. So we're getting better today. Um, Sweden banned antibiotic use for growth promotion in 86 and the rest of the EU did it by 2006. The USA is no longer using medically important antibiotics. Indian and China is getting, is banning the use of colistin, which is a last resort antibiotic and is attempting to phase out their antibiotic growth promoters. Um, most dairy cattle in Canada and the States, or I won't even say most, many dairy cattle in Canada and the States are still treated with antibiotics um, to prevent mastitis. Organic farms don't do this, um, which is great because you have some cows not, but they tend to have higher rates of mastitis. And some dairy farms, approximately 20%, are picking and choosing cows that are particularly prone to infection. So they're cutting down on their antibiotics just by providing better management practices, which is also really good. Um, in Canada, the chicken farmers have themselves limited the use of category one. So those are your very medically important antibiotics in 2014. They don't use category two, which are your kind of medically important antibiotics as of 2018. And they're attempting to eliminate the use of category three antibiotics. Um, so even though antibiotic growth promoters are banned, preventative and curative antibiotics are still prevented um, to stop infection when they happen. 
So basically every country still uses antibiotics in food production to some extent. Some countries use more than others. This is a map that shows per, per kilogram of meat how many antibiotics are used to make that. Um, so, you know, it's based on self-reporting. You have to take it with a grain of salt, but still a lot of antibiotics get used globally to produce meat. Um, a lot of people find this surprising because um, they say Europe still uses antibiotics in agriculture. I thought they, you know, knocked that off years ago. Um, they use it to be sold as therapeutic products. So they're not using it for growth promotion. They're using it for sick animals. They're also significantly reducing it year to year, which is wonderful. Um, and they're using things that we don't tend to use in human medicine, like tetracyclines, penicillins, and sulfanamides. Um, their use of a medically important antibiotics, so the things we use for really severe human infections, accounts for less, percent, less than 5% of their total antibiotics used. So they do still use it, but they're doing it fairly responsibly, um, which Brings me to the next slide. Um, I've been talking about category one, two, and three antibiotics. So category one are antibiotics that are very important for human medicine, and there's nothing else we have if there's resistance to these category one. Um, the ones we tend to use in agriculture, like the bacitracins or the ionophores, are the category three and four, which we don't really use in human medicine. So this is the Canadian kind of approach, like save ones for human medicine and then allow agriculture to use the ones we're not going to use anyways, which is a relatively good approach. Um, but there can be a thing called cross resistance. Um, so when bacteria develop resistance to a single antibiotic, um, that resistance can transfer to other antibiotics um, and they can be resistant to things that's never seen before. So virginomycin is commonly used in poultry and swine. And the thing that gives you resistance to virginomycin is an acetyl trans is a virginomycin acetyl transferase. Synersid is an antibiotic that is semi-synthetic, and we use it to treat MRSA, which is a really serious infection in humans. Virginomycin acetyl transferases also give you resistance to synersid. So it's not that big of a jump in logic to think that our use of virginomycin might be driving our resistance to synersid. Uh, the second example of this is bacitracin, which is commonly used in poultry and swine. MCR1 confers resistance to colistin, which is an antibiotic of last resort. MCR1 also confers resistance to bacitracin. So again, it's not that big of a jump in logic to think that our use of bacitracin is probably driving some resistance to colistin as well. So if we, our projected use of antibiotics is going up every year, um, by 2030, if we don't change anything, it's likely we'll use uh, about 200,000 tons of antibiotics in food production by 2030. So some options for at least making this number smaller is to reduce the amount of meat we eat to 165 grams a day or to 40 grams a day, or limit the amount of antibiotic that you're supposed to use for the amount of meat that you produce. Um, both of these would do that, uh, but changing human behavior is difficult, um, and we eat a lot of meat. Uh, so if you're over 165 grams a day, uh, I'm showing you country in red, and the average American actually eats a lot more than that. So if you had um, a goal where you were going to limit meat consumption to per 40 grams per day, the average American would have to reduce their meat consumption by 90% in the next 10 years. And I just, um, I don't, I don't see that happening. Um, so I, I think we have to think outside the box and come up with other solutions than trying to change human behavior. Um, so a question I get a lot is, is it worth it? Like, like if, you know, we're driving this really bad crisis, is it worth it to keep using antibiotics in agriculture? Or do we have to do that? And some argue that if animal-based protein were removed tomorrow, these issues would go away. And to a certain extent, that's true, but I, we don't have time to do that. Um, so also we have to remember that this is really leading to food production efficiency and it's keeping the animals healthy. 
So prior to the use of antibiotics, there was 95% more mastitis in dairy cows than there is now. Other interventions such as um, on-farm good management practices, better nutrition, better dairy breeding have also helped. But definitely antibiotic use has led to, you know, a 95% reduction in this disease, which is very painful for the dairy cow um, and not at all pleasant for them. Um, antibiotic growth promoters have also led to an increase in broilers by 8%, and it improves feed um, efficiency by about 5%. So your birds are getting 5% bigger off the same amount of food, which seems like a small number, but when you think about the number of birds produced, it's a big overall savings in the amount of food you have to make to feed your food. So the other thing to think about is that no antibiotic chickens, um, the mortality rate during the growth period there is about 4.2%. In conventionally raised broilers, where they are getting some antibiotic for therapeutic effects, um, the mortality rate is 2.9%. So it's a 1.3% difference, which again, doesn't seem like a lot, but the United States made 10 billion broilers last year. So that 1.3% converts into 130 million chickens. And if they die during the growth period, we're not eating them. So it's 130 million chickens that you had to feed and you didn't get to eat. It's the carbon emissions that you had to output while making the food for these guys. And it's all the water that you had to use to feed them too. So it's a big strain on the overall environment to lose this um, growth promotion and to lose the birds with illnesses that you maybe didn't have to lose. Um, also, antibiotics, uh, birds that are raised without antibiotics have several markers of poor welfare, including more eye burns, more lesions on their foot pads, and air sacculitis. Um, so also pig growth is performed or is improved by about 4.2% and feed efficiency by about 2.2% which again seems like a small number, but we raise a lot of pigs. Another question often is, is limiting use effective? And it, it is for the most part. Um, so Quebec had voluntary withdrawal of cephalosporins in uh, chickens in 2005. So this is where Quebec started, stopped using cephalosporins um, in chickens. And you can see these are uh, salmonella and E. coli isolates from humans and from chickens that were resistant to cephalosporins. And just a couple years later, after that voluntary withdrawal, you just, you see everything plummet to, you know, 10% where they were at 60 or 70%. So limiting use of antibiotics does effectively stop antibiotic resistance. Um, but again, then you're suffering the consequences of lower production. So the WHO has a five-pronged approach to combating antimicrobial resistance. And I think the big one here, for me at least in my research program, is to reduce the incidence of infection. If you have less infections, you don't have to need, use them as much and you stop losing the benefits of using them for growth promotion as well. Um, so one of the things that I've seen in my studies is that when we use antibiotics as a positive control for testing some of our other growth promoting substances, sometimes we lose statistical significance of our positive control. And this is because our barn is exceptionally clean, our staff is exceptionally well trained, and the animals have access to really high food. And because of this, you, they don't get the infections or they don't get the bad microbiome that would limit their growth and make antibiotics infective in the first place. Um, because we see this, it gives you some hope that we can address a lot of this just on management practices, but we really have to, you know, start doing that. Um, also, Using the available vaccines for agriculture animals is an absolute must. If you get a preventable, a vaccine preventable infection, it's going to lead to secondary infections, which, you know, use up antibiotics. Uh, this is true in humans as well. So anytime people can get vaccines, it's a step towards limiting the effects of this oncoming crisis. Um, so agriculture without antibiotics 
is probably possible, but we need to see a couple things happen. Um, so the arguments that it is probably possible is that you can see similar feed efficiency improvements when you improve on farm management. If you have a really good farmer who's really clean with really good hygiene and the animals are very healthy, you lose the effect of antibiotics in several instances. Um, there's been a lot of economic research on banning antibiotics in agriculture that actually show that this might actually make farmers make more money. If you're a good farmer with good hygiene, you may actually benefit from lower antibiotics or no antibiotics on your farm. Then another thing to think about is whether the market will sustain the increase of cost that's probably going to come along with this, because um, not everyone is capable of the good hygiene. Um, so one study found that a ban on antibiotics would result in an increase of three to six cents per pound of meat, which is, they found, um, sustainable for the average consumer. And one of the things that you can kind of argue in this direction is that there's a current premium on boneless, skinless chicken breasts of 30 cents a kilogram, and the market has sustained a steady year-over-year -year rise in the popularity of boneless, skinless chicken breasts. So my opinion is that we can probably feed ourselves without antibiotics in agriculture, but I'm not thoroughly confident in this answer. Um, I think that new technologies are probably key to solving this. And if they're specific to agriculture and not human medicine, so things we can use for our animals that we are not going to use on our humans, I think there's even more of a chance of a success in this area. So I'm gonna spend just the last 10 minutes talking about my research. Um, so I work on the microbiome of food producing animals and try to strengthen it so that it actually works to prevent infection. So the microbiome is basically this big consortium community of bacteria and viruses um, and even some eukaryotes that live in and on us and live in and on agricultural animals. Um, the community is very effective at stopping some infections from happening. So we've all probably heard of Clostridium difficile. This is what you get when you're in the hospital on antibiotics for a long time. The antibiotics wipe out your microbiome and make you susceptible to Clostridium difficile. If you're healthy with a healthy microbiome and you haven't been on an antibiotics, you just don't get this organism. It's only a disease of an unhealthy microbiome. Clostridium botulinum is another one. Adults never get this. You never get a Clostridium botulinum infection because it's just such a poor competitor that as soon as it enters your gastrointestinal tract, all the other bacteria out can kill it. Kids, however, in their first six months of life don't have that same microbiome in their intestine and Clostridium botulinum can colonize them and cause an infection. Um, there's other evidence out there that a microbiome can stop infections. And one of the pieces is that in my lab, we try to give mice salmonella infections to study the salmonella infection. And it's really difficult to get a mouse to have a salmonella infection if you don't first feed them antibiotics. If you don't wipe out their microbiome, salmonella can't compete and get in there. There's something in there that stops the salmonella from colonizing. So the question that my lab tries to look at is that if we can make the microbiome of these food producing animals better and stronger, can they outcompete? Can they act like another immune system so that the animal never gets the infection and doesn't need the antibiotics? Um, so in one study we've been looking at, um, this is dairy production. So this is the microbiome of 10 dairy cows in Quebec before, during, and after infection with Staphylococcus for the whole year of 2019. Um, and what you're seeing on the chart is how different the microbiomes from each cow were. Each dot represents a different cow at a different time point. And what you can see is kind of they cluster by herds. So each herd had its own unique microbiome, which was kind of interesting. But we wanted to take this data and look at the cows that did get infection and compare with them with the cows that didn't get infection and see if there were differences in those microbiomes. Um, so we did that. Uh, for these cows. Uh, there were 600 um, samples that we used in this analysis. And basically what this chart shows is the amount of certain bacteria on this axis, and the name of the bacteria are here, and the amount of inflammation that we saw in the cow udder 
at that time that we identified these bacteria. So if there's more inflammation, it means there's an infection, uh, in this case with Staphylococcus aureus. If there's lower uh, SCC, it means there's probably not infection. So these bacteria up here are likely associated with some type of infection and inflammation, whereas these guys you're seeing in the healthy quarters that didn't get infection. So when you look up here at what was really popular in the in the cows without an infection, you can start to pull apart what might be part of a healthy bovine utter microbiome. Um, and we observed two particular genuses of bacteria, Staphylococcus, which also causes infection, but in this scenario kind of seems to be a good guy, and Aerococcus, which in this scenario probably seems to be a good guy. Um, so we took the samples uh, that were associated with high levels of Staphylococcus and Aerococcus, and we did something called metagenomic sequencing. Metagenomic sequencing allows us to take this from a genus, which both of these are, to a species. And when we did this, we were able to know, name two specific species that were associated with very low inflammation in cows that were concurrent with cows that had high inflammation caused by Staphylococcus aureus. And when we went back and got isolates of Aerococcus and Staphylococcus, and put them on a plate. So all of the bacteria on this plate that you're seeing are Staphylococcus and they're growing really happy. But when we put the Aerococcus on there, there was no growth. Um, so we're trying to compare that with the other Staphylococcus we, seen too, we saw as well um, to see if we see the same thing again. But we do have a bacteria in this scenario that was part of the bovine microbiome that is now stopping the growth of Staphylococcus. So it's a really, solid piece of evidence that microbiome modification to prevent infection might actually be possible. And that's it. Um, I want to thank the students in my lab who do all the work and they have a lot of fun and all of the people who uh, help pay for it. And that is it. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Rodholm. Yes. So um, we'll open the floor now to questions. So I'm going to read some questions from the chat just to start things off. And you're welcome to post your own questions in the chat as well. We'll get to as many as we can. Or if you prefer, you can take your mouse to the bottom of the screen and choose the reactions button and raise your virtual hand so I can see you. Or you can turn on your camera and wave at me. I think I'll be able to see you then too. And I'll ask you to unmute yourself and you can ask your question. So Jennifer, the first question is from Satwick um, who asks, do you think reducing effective dose of antimicrobials by improving bioavailability against bacteria using better drug delivery techniques would slow down AMR mechanisms? This is something Satwick works on and might know a bit more about them than I do. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it's a, it's, an, it's a good approach. Like anything where, I mean, if you give the bacteria a chance where they're coexisting with the antibiotic, it gives them the opportunity to develop resistance. If you target the antibiotic directly into the cell and you don't get that coexistence for that prolonged evolutionary time, yeah. I mean, it, I, I think it's a good approach. I think your project's worth it, Sal. Keep going. <laughs> All right. So now we have a question from Kevin Wade. What's in it for the good bacteria in our microbiome? And why don't they cause infection? That's a great question. Um, it's a nice place to live. Your gut's a safe place for them. They're not, until you die, which they don't know is going to happen, they're constantly warm, surrounded by food. Um, it's a great place to live. Uh, they don't cause infection because they don't have the makeup to do that. Uh, your immune system keeps them in check um, and they don't have any of the genes that would allow them to overcome your immune system or attach on or cause cellular lysis or any of the things that you're upset about when it happens. All right, thank you. Uh, a question from Marilyn Scott. Would improving management as a means to reduce antibiotic use be transferable to other countries, thinking of China or rural settings in Africa? 
Yeah, that's a good question too. Um, the something I struggle with, um, cause like, you know, when you're, when you're farming in some rural settings, you don't have my concrete blocked, sealed, walled barn. And it's, I don't know if you're ever going to get it. Um, so management becomes a lot harder in those scenarios. And I honestly don't know what we're gonna do about that. Um, obviously rural China and rural Africa still need to produce enough food to live. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> uh, it, the management strategies we come up with aren't gonna work there. Can they come up with their own management strategies that work in their specific situations, hopefully? Um, but I don't have a great answer for that. Um, I'm just going to exercise my liberty as moderator and interject with my own question. I wonder how much antibiotic use is there in rural settings like that? My understanding, though I haven't been there, is quite a lot. Okay, thank you. Um, so another follow-up question from Satwick. Um, if I'm not wrong, he says, according to the results you showed us, Bacterial sins is helping in reducing pathogenic, pathogenic bacterial load. Is that correct? Um, bacteriosins, I don't think I talked about in this. Um, bacteriosins are a class of molecule produced by bacteria to kill other bacteria. So in some scenarios, yes, bacteriosins... Um, reduce pathogenic bacterial load, but I didn't show you any data about that today. Do you want to clarify? Okay. You can unmute yourself. Yeah, I, I got it there wrong, go. actually. Uh, no, I understand it. Right. Okay, thank you so much. Yep. <laughs> okay, so I invite the rest of the audience, if you have questions, to um, please turn on your video or even just unmute yourself and wave at me or post your question in the chat. Either will work. I have a question for you, Jennifer. Um, you, you talked about the development of um, antibiotic resistance in microbes and the ability of the microbes to transfer genes even among different species, for instance. Is there any risk of those antibiotics being ingested directly by humans in our food? Is specific antibiotics being ingested in our food? Mm -hmm. So if we're treating, for instance, beef cattle or pigs with antibiotics, is there a risk to our own, to ingesting those antibiotics ourselves? Yeah, um, in some places there is. In Canada, we have pretty strict lines that food with antibiotics doesn't make it into our food supply. So for things with like chicken or pig or beef, we have withdrawal periods where they're not slaughtered with antibiotics in their system. So we try to keep it out that way. With dairy, if there's antibiotics in the milk, the milk is dumped. And if the milk tests positive for antibiotics later, uh, it's still dumped and the farmer has to pay for all the dumped milk. Um, so there's a lot of incentive to not put antibiotics in our food supply. I don't think there's a lot of antibiotics coming into my house in food. Um, that being said, um, we have a lab in my class, my undergrad class every year, where we look for multi-drug resistant anti, multi-drug resistant organisms on 10 meat products from the grocery store in St. Anne's. And 100% of the time we find multi-drug resistant uh, organisms on those meat products. So we are ingesting multi-drug resistant organisms. Um, most of them aren't pathogens, and I don't know what the significance of that action is. I don't think anyone else knows either, um, but we're not consuming the actual antibiotics routinely. Okay, thanks. Um, just to follow up on that, um, is this something that the Canadian Food Inspection Agency checks for with imported food? Yeah, so CFIA checks for the presence of antibiotics on imported food. They also check for antibiotic resistant pathogens on imported food and domestic food as well. So it is something that is monitored and watched for and reported. And your food gets sent back if there's antibiotics that doesn't come into our food supply. It's actionable. Okay, thank you. Um, so here's a question from Alexander. 
If we're using microbes such as probiotics, could we see resistance or exclusion to the administered populations eventually? Could we see probiotics become resistant to antibiotics? Is that the question? Yeah, Alexander, if, you, if you'd like to unmute yourself, you can ask the question directly. Hey, hey Jen, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, hey, great talk, nice, thank you. Um, just wondering, uh, you know, if we've, we come up with, uh, you know, probiotics, uh, could uh, resident populations that we're planning or attempting to affect, could they develop some type of resistance? Yeah, population? yeah, I mean, like anything can develop resistance if it's exposed to antibiotics. But I mean, if your probiotics develop resistance, you're not that worried about it. Like they could transfer the genes to a pathogen someday when you get sick. But I don't think it's that concern. What, what I mean is uh, if we are administering, say, probiotics that were like in a farm setting, for instance. Okay. Uh, those probiotics would be considered new into the into the farm right into a flock right so the you know natural whatever is exist oh. pre-existing prior to the administration of probiotics could we have problems with the probiotics themselves just like anti antibiotics right yeah yeah okay i get your question now thanks yeah. um yeah i i think there's been a number of studies that show that if you wipe the microbiome out prior to giving someone probiotics, the probiotics are more effective and take up more residence. If you don't wipe the microbiome out prior to introducing probiotics, like some of them take, some of them don't take, some of them walk right. right through. So the microbiome does provide a really good level of resistance towards I colonization by probiotics. Okay, thank you. No problem. All right, thanks, Alexander. All right, do we have any other questions from the audience? Again, I invite you, you know, to click on your virtual hand or turn on your video and wave at me or post in the chat. Okay, here's another one from Marilyn. Um, as the microbiome is presumably shared among animals in the same herd or flock, is it known how quickly AMR will spread within that herd or flock? And is there any concern that AMR spreads to animals beyond livestock? Um, I do not know of a paper that looks at how quickly it spreads within a herd and flock. That might exist, but if it does, I don't know about it. It does obviously spread because you do see the an animals, you do see microbiome spread between animals in the same flock. So it probably does. Um, but I'm aware, unaware of data that says how quickly. If it spreads beyond animals, um, to animals beyond livestock, yes. Um, there have been a number of studies, not as many as there should be, because I think this is a really important question, but there's been a couple that shows that if you look at wild populations in proximity to a farm, or if you look at wildlife populations in proximity to a human garbage dump or a human hospital, those animals have higher levels of antibiotic resistance genes and antibiotic resistance pathogens than their wild counterparts that don't live in proximity to a farm, garbage dump, hospital. Um, so you, there's definitely spread to wild animals. Um, but there's not enough research to indicate how much and how much it moves. Impact on them. Um, that's a good question too. I don't know. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I haven't seen a study that shows that kind of thing. And that's a really complicated study to run. So hopefully someone does that soon. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any other questions from the audience? No question is too small or too large. Okay, going once, going twice, gone. Okay, well, thank you very much, Jennifer, for taking the time to speak to us this evening. It was a fascinating talk and one that's very topical and interesting to lots of people. So I appreciate that very much. I'd like to thank uh, Ingrid and Anna again for working behind the scenes to help things run smoothly.
And I'd like to invite our audience to join us for the next lecture in the series, which will be on the afternoon or evening of October the 6th, at the same time, 5.30. And we'll listen to Professor Chandra Madhurmudu talk to us about how water use in agriculture has changed over the decades. So have a good evening, everybody. Um, enjoy the fall weather while it lasts. <laughs>